We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. This week, we let our awesome Patreon patrons pick our topic, and you too can help us decide what to talk about by joining them at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. The question they pick comes from Scott W., who asks, Here's my question for everyone in the hobby, and it's one I struggle with. What is your good sale to bad game ratio? I guess I mean, how low does a price have to be before you buy a bad game? Well, thanks for the great question, Scott. Uh, this should be an interesting one that I hope leads to some interesting discussion. Well, almost everything we talk about here on the show is subjective and is going to vary person to person. This one in particular is going to be very personal. And what applies to me probably doesn't apply to Sean and may not apply to anyone else out there either. Though I do think it's going to be fun exercise to talk about this. Indeed, nothing we say here will be absolute and probably not even absolute for us. Yeah. Our ideas about this may have and almost certainly have shifted by situations like the pandemic, not to mention financial situations in life. Yes. So that was my first thought. When I first read this question, I was like, man, has this changed over the years? Going all the way back. Like way back when I got allowance from my parents and the first game I ever bought was a Games Workshop copy of Talisman 2nd Edition from Leisure World. At that point, every penny was precious. So I would never pick up a game that looked bad. The thing is, I didn't know what was good or bad then. There was no, well, there might have been an internet being used <laughs> by the military or something, but there was no public internet like we have now. And to find out if a game was good or not, you basically had to hear it from someone else. Or there were a few magazines out there, like Dragon Magazine, but that tended to cover RPGs. Like, you might hear about it in some kind of hobby magazine. And for me, what that indicator was, is Games Workshop was brilliant. They knew they had a hit with Talisman, and they used to print other games that had a little Talisman on them that said, by the makers of Talisman. And at that point, I literally would not buy a game unless it had that on it. Because every one I bought, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, uh, Fury of Dracula, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, were all good. So I just kept buying games with that. Now, as I got more income, I got a little bit more adventurous. And I, then what I was looking for is what I call bookcase games. And I was looking for that shape, that size. And that led me to some Mayfair games, uh, similar to one we'll be reviewing tonight later on the show, actually, though I didn't get that one at the time, like Sanctuary from Mayfair and a Warlock uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain game and the Willow board game from a few different companies. I think that one was published by Tor. Jumping further ahead, there's a point where, you know, I'm working, Dan and I are together, I don't have a gaming budget, and I buy games now and then, and I will admit, most of the time, there was some research out there, I could see what was going on, I would buy stuff on site right like that that was still how i discovered games is i would go to the local game store or well at that time even there was the sci-fi shop i would go into the sci-fi shop or later hugan and munin and i'd look around but by then it was smarter and i knew a little better so what my source was with games magazine and but i get swayed by this so i would go into the store planning to buy say Catan. that was one of the ones i bought because it won the games magazine top 100 and i bought Catan. But then while I'm in there, if Ian happened to have out a sales shelf, and uh, I particularly remember he had a bunch of the Fantasy Flight Silver Line games, which were all little boxes about this big for 10 bucks each. I, at the time, I was making pretty good money. We had an apartment. The rent wasn't ridiculous. I had the money on hand, and I bought every one he had. I bought a copy of every one of these Silver Line games. And I have, with mixed results, we'll just say there. So what about you, like, in the earlier... Well, again, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't the gamer early on. So for me, you know, it was I didn't have a source. I didn't have uh, Games Magazine or anything like that. So it was uh, yeah. And, and I admit, hey, I, I had be, been burned early in life with video games. Uh, yeah. um, and, and anyone who is uh, old enough to remember the Atari and Commodore 64 years where the boxes were amazing and the games were anything but. Um, you know, they weren't all as bad as E.T., but there were some some definite uh, groaners out there. And you learn to really kind of be a little more cautious before spending your hard earned money at the time, you know, especially as a kid on something that looked like it might be fun. But 
you never really know until you get it open. Um, luckily, games would generally have a lot more detail on the back of the box, back in the old, yeah. you know, Milton Bradley, you know, big size family board game uh, days. You had a better idea of, of what was going on inside the game, uh, especially compared to video games. Yeah, I remember those days of getting being so excited. Even Nintendo, the original NES system, where I used to buy my games at the superstore because they had the best selection. Those games were like sixty to eighty dollars. Here I am spending my allowance and save up, and sometimes you bring home a, a wrecking crew, or, or <laughs> I, I'm, I, that's the worst one I can remember. Kluklu Land, you know, they're just these terrible games. Yep. So then eventually, of course, we get to the point when um, I started sharing deals, which, which oh man, is 20 years ago now. <laughs> Back in uh, 2002, when I started up the WDGR, and we basically started having a budget. And that is where this amount went up. And it literally would vary by how much was in the bank account. At the time, we were mainly I was mainly sharing deals on Amazon. And I kept it in Amazon credit because at the time it wasn't being used to buy groceries or anything. And it just sat there and I would wait for a sale on Amazon. And then we had Han Solo who lived over in Detroit, who would um, get games to me from a U.S. address, we'll just say. And I, it would be crazy. Like there'd be a buy to get one free sale, like the ones we often share at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. And what it like, there was no limit. Cause it'd be like, if I needed three games, I would pick the two games I want. I'm like, oh, I can get whatever, Terraforming Mars and Imperial Settlers. And then I'd be like, oh, I need a third game. And I'd try to find something in the same price range. So I'm looking for another $40 game. And in my head, I'm like, eh, it was free. Or if it was good, I got 33% off. So it's one or the other. I either got 33% off two games I really wanted, or I got a game free, depending on if it was good or not. If it was good or not, hey, I saved money. If it wasn't, I got a free game. And I bought that. That's when my pile of shame got to over 100 games was was in that time frame where I just I had the money I, and we had the budget like I, all the bills and expenses were covered by my day job and everything I got from gaming went into gaming and I'll admit I made some really bad choices I bought some <laughs> really bad games and I was just like eh, it's a bad game we'll put it in the extra life auction we'll give it away as a prize at a local gaming event and we've even had ones where like people are overplaying games I'm like take it home I when you got the money, you can do that, right? And I think that is probably the biggest impact on this question is how much disposable income do you have? Like board gaming is a hobby and it should be treated as a hobby, but it's also a rewarding hobby that can be healthy, right? Like there's a, there's a form of self-care involved and doing things you love can be very healthy and good for you to make you forget about the horrible stuff, especially with all the garbage going on in the world right now. So it's not... I'm not saying you shouldn't spend money on it. It's a hobby. Don't spend your money. I'm saying you just have to be reasonable about it. And it's a worthwhile thing to spend your money on. But how much you can spend is obviously going to depend on how much you make and how, what your budget is. No, absolutely. It's, it, there's, and it, there's also how deep in the hobby you are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, for, for me, even with more disposable income, uh, as much as I love board gaming, uh, for me, I don't get as many games with my family played for as you for one yeah. reason. Uh, and so maybe I'm more likely to splurge on a solo game, but not as much on, you know, the bigger, you know, a Euro a or something, game. a legacy game. Uh, and because that's just where the hobby has taken me and where my family and my life has taken me, even though I might have that disposable income. Although on the other hand, if it's cheap enough, it may be something I pick up, put on a shelf and bring down to Windsor yep. to play with the bellhop next time. So there's, there's certainly um, a price point at which it becomes, ah, oh, you know what, this could be fun. Maybe I'm not going to play it for six months because I have to get down to Windsor, but it could be fun enough to be, make that worthwhile. All right, I'm going to bring up one in particular I know you bought because it was cheap enough and you're like, it might be interesting. What did you pay for Marvel Strike Team? Uh, that was... that's exactly what that was, Yeah, right? no, was that was. A, uh, and you know, that's you know cheap enough. It was it was a significant deal because I know the reason I got it was because it was on discount with CG um, the gaming deals, um, so it was probably at least sixty percent off. Yeah. Um, okay. I, w I was wondering because that might set your point. I think it was it was like eighteen to sixteen bucks. Yeah, and it was it was cheap enough that buying it on Amazon dot com and shipping it was still a cheap deal. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean we're probably talking in the you know twenty five dollars all in taxes and shipping. Right. 
So that's an example of one for Sean. Now, I, like I said, my, my first example was definitely those silver line games from Fantasy Flight, 10 bucks a game. And Fantasy Flight, right? So again, I'm not, I'm making an educated guess. I'm going Fantasy Flight produces good games in general. I like a lot of Fantasy Flight games. So I'm stacking the odds when I buy this. So let's say all, all the buy two, get one free sales, all that happens. Uh, whatever, there's board game deals and sometimes I go a little crazy or a little overboard. And at the time, I was meeting up with Han Solo twice a week and unloading a trunk of games. It, it was a bit much. It's the reason I'm out of room. And it was kind of awesome, but I, I was buying them quicker than I could play them. And it was the growth of the pile of sheep. Because at one time, I just had one chair in my basement that had the unplayed games. And it was one chair full and it kind of grew. But like eventually, it made, came two stacks. And then they started like falling off the top. And once I had to find a new solution other than the chair, um, which is, I didn't call them pile of shames then. I just called it the chair of opportunity or something like that. I don't remember what I called it. But once they actually became stacks I, around my room and there were multiples, I'm like, whoa, I got to slow down. And at that point, I completely changed my buying habits. To the point now, I actually only bought games that I knew would be good. Like I, I would do the research at this point much further into the internet. I've, I've, I've got the Windsor Gaming resource. I'm interacting with local gamers all the time. I'm talking to people at two to three different local game stores. I've now joined Board Game Geek. I can now look at the hotness and I can do research. And I, in general, would not buy anything sight unseen or not knowing something about it. There was one exception. Whenever... I was spending money. I would often spend money on games. And usually when we were spending money with some form of vacation, whether it was we traveled somewhere or I was at a con or we even if we had a staycation, we're like, you know what? We took a week off work. We're going to eat out this week. We're going to go for breakfast. We're going to walk down Ottawa Street. We're just going to do fun things locally. When we were, When I was in that spending mood, and I think more so I could convince Deanna to let go some of the money to be in the spending mood. Uh, we would, we'd end up often buying games, especially on vacation. On vacation, I love going to a local game store wherever we've gone and finding something for us to play back in the hotel room. Because we often stay up later than other than, than your average person on vacation and stuff closes down and shuts down and we're looking for something to do before going to bed. So often we would sit there and pick up games and it's the same thing right like i we did a comic book tour where we hit every comic book and hobby shop in southwest ontario just as like a trip as something to do and i bought plenty of stuff i normally wouldn't buy because i wanted to support these places we were discovering i'm like hey new store i want to support them let's buy something small here let's buy that or we went to uh cleveland on vacation because i'm an idiot and wanted to go to cleveland i don't even know and we found this awesome store and i bought a bunch of feng shui books so this doesn't even just apply to role-playing or sorry board games it also applies to role-playing games so i will admit when i'm spending money when we're in that spending mood i will be more open to picking up stuff i normally wouldn't now again though i i've at this point i'm immersed in board game media I wasn't into podcasts, but I was reading forums. I was I said board game geek being the big one. I was watching board game geek. I was looking at the hotness. I was looking at the top list. So I tended to already know the games that were out there. And I usually had an opinion on them before we got there. But the pile of shame as far as regular purchases throughout the year almost caused me to stop. Now and then, though, there would be that hot new game or there'd be a good enough deal and I'd pick up some stuff. I, and I have to say, you know, talking about this, I, I really hadn't all that much to say about it. And then I thought, you know, there's a whole other side of this that we don't necessarily talk about. And that's my pile of shame right here of, of role playing games mm -hmm. uh, that I've got because I do this, but with role playing games. Um, and, games. and you know what? I going on to RPG or, you know, uh, drive through RPG uh, can be dangerous for me because if it says super, um, I probably want it at some point. <laughs> yep. uh, now, sometimes if it's if it's at a certain point, it goes into my uh, wish list. Uh, but there is a certain point where, especially for downloadable only stuff, if the, if it doesn't have physical uh, copies, um, you know, five bucks, six bucks, seven bucks, yeah, it'll pro I'll probably grab it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little more picky when it comes to the physical copies, but 
five star RPG has sales all the time. So as soon as, you know, if it's, uh, you know, under 50 bucks for a saw for a hardcover book, RP, RPG deal, book, yeah. I'm probably going to buy that. <laughs> uh, go. if it's a super RPG and, and add it onto the pile of books, I may or may not ever actually write or read or run. There you go. See, Sean thought the topic didn't apply. Yeah. What about non supers? Do you ever get tempted by like, there's an RPG drive through RPG sale and you're like, Oh, maybe, uh, you know what? I, other than super stuff, generally no, uh, okay. or at least super adjacent stuff. Every right. once in a while, there'll be something where it's like, Oh, that sounds like it could be something I could turn into villains for a game. Uh, and maybe I'll go that way, but generally no, uh, because I don't, do any rpgs except for super stuff mm -hmm. at this point uh i haven't found anything that i can think of off the top of my head that has attracted me and, and, and you know been cheap enough to pick up anyway all right so it actually got to this point right so i wasn't buying games pretty much almost never and and if i did it had it had to be something i already knew right like yes i would still buy cheap games but i wasn't buying bad games which we'll talk about bad games in a minute we'll get into that what what is a bad game and what isn't but now it's even less, right? So now I get review copies, right? Like I've been getting review copies of games since 2002, but I didn't do it as active as I do now. Like it was one of those every now and then someone would discover my blog or my forum and be like, hey, we'll send you a review copy and it tended to be stuff that was indie published. I uh, reviewed a lot more RPGs back then. But nowadays we have a relationship with a number of board game publishers who send us stuff on a pretty regular basis. And I am no longer like I'm getting that fix the new game fix through the review copies we get. Now, because of that, I literally went all of last year without buying a single game. There was, I didn't buy anything as long as I, as D might correct me, but I can't think of anything I bought in the last year. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm forgetting something, but then also I'm getting gifts from my friends and family that are in the form of games. And those tend to get me the ones I wasn't able to get review copies. And if there's a game I really want, I'll reach out and I'll reach out to the publisher and I'll try to get it. And sometimes they say no, uh, often they say no, to be honest. Um, and then usually I just move on, right? It used to be that I'd be like, you got to have it, but there's so many games out there. There's something else that'll catch my eye. So because of that, I haven't felt the name was walk in and buy something. Like like we, we have gone to the local game store and I want to support them and I'll spend money there. But because of the pandemic, we're not even going to the store all that often. And what I've been buying from the local game store is stuff like dice, um, supplements, stuff for the kids. We bought quite a few kids games there. And yeah, Boxing Day, I did make a purchase, but it was with a gift card. But yes, I did make a purchase. And that was 2020 a, Boxing Day. That so was that's more than a year ago, well over a year ago now. Yeah, 2020, so. I bought Clans of Caledonia and two other games. That's at, the last I can think of. That's the last I can think of too. So I think that's the last time. So, and, and we're actually like... There's just so many games out there and so many good games. I just don't feel like wasting my time or money on bad games. And like, to be honest, we get offered review copies of games that I turn down now. And I've had people contact me and say, Hey, I'm purging my collection. Do you want these? And I've been like, no, <laughs> like <laughs> give them to someone else. I don't need them. Like I did accept a large donation of games from someone locally recently um, that I got at a good price, which again, bumped the pile of shame back up. Um, but now I'm at the point that I think the only way I would spend any money at any amount on something I didn't already want would be that vacation thing. And well, with the pandemic, we're not even doing that. But like if we took a trip up to London, if everything was normal and Dan and I went up to London and I walked into City Lights Bookstore and on the U shelf was, I don't even know, a Feng Shui shorts book for five bucks, I'd probably buy it. But without that in-person traveling, I don't even think I would like, it's just not happening now. No, absolutely. And one thing I would probably, again, we live in the, in, in dark times. Um, you know, if I were out, um, going to thrift stores, there's the, ch there is the chance where there, mm. where this topic, I think most fits is where you see those bad games or you know the the family style games that we know aren't good games they're not even hobby games yep. some of them are barely games at all but that's where i'm tempted uh you know where it's that thrift mm -hmm. store you're getting it for next to nothing 
and you might end up spending 50 bucks, but you come out with, you know, seven games um, or more. Uh, and that's, I think, where it come, becomes really tempting to me. It's that stuff that you can't get new in, you, you know, you can't get in shrink wrap. You're right. only going to find it in the used bookstores or the thrift stores or, you know, someone's, you know, sell, sh sell shelf. Um, and a lot of it for me is I want to play the bad game to say I've played the bad game. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what's going to do it for me. And that's where, you know, if maybe even 10 bucks, you know, depending on what it is, if it's one of those, oh, my God, I can't believe they made a game about that. Yeah. Master of the Universe level stuff, you know, that that mm -hmm. horrible stuff that you just want to be able to say, oh, yeah, I played yeah, that. I played that. Junk. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. Uh, thrifting is definitely a thing. But even like even for me, when I'm thrifting, though, I'm I'm looking for games that I know are good or worth money. And even then, like we pass up on stuff. We know those where we, we Dana and I used to own a business where we sold stuff on eBay collectibles, mainly retro toys, but also some of that was games. And I know certain games are worth money. And I'm not talking necessarily about Hero Quest and Heroes Gate, but there were other ones. And like we pass those up even. So it, it's all the extra work that goes with it. So I don't have that one as much. So the one thing I do think is interesting is now when I don't have the Amazon credit just sitting there. I have way more restraint shopping online. Though every now and then a sale can suck me in. It's got to be pretty big. Like, it's got to be pretty big. And plus, I have to be interested in the game somehow, some way. Whereas if I walk into a store and there's a clearance section, I got to admit I'm tempted. Especially locally, but that's also wanting to support local businesses. Like, there's an aspect of that that has nothing to do with how much I want the game and more to do with can I afford to support the store and here's a way I can do it. And I get something I might enjoy. So that is a totally different scale to me where that price points probably in like, like $5 easy. I walk in there and there's a $5 thing that looks at all interesting. I'm probably just going to buy it $10. I'm probably going to consider it, especially if it's something I want probably all the way up to 30 bucks. If I'm looking at like a hardcover RPG rule book. And to be honest, that's why I now have the Sentinel comics RPG and the Warhammer RPG is they had a clearance sale. And D happened to be in there to pick up something else and was like, Oh yeah, why not? Right. <laughs> at this price point, like I know Mo's been curious about these. Maybe it'll be a year and a half or two years before we play them. But at that price point, we can't pass it up. And I totally would have backed up that purchase while we were there. Yeah. Well, uh, there's there's definitely something about online purchasing versus in-person purchasing. There's a huge difference. And I would say, generally speaking, in person, you are more likely to to go with a, a splurge mm -hmm. purchase. And, uh, whereas online you've got time to say okay well i'll put it in my cart but now i'm gonna go open up a new tab go over to bgg and see if you know marvel strike force is yeah. even a decent game you know if it, if, it, if it's rated four on board game geek i'm gonna take that back out of my cart yep. even if it is only 25 dollars and 75 mm percent -hmm. off with free ship free next day shipping because it's you know what a, a licensed game like that a licensed modern game that's rating that low isn't even going to be a i believe i can't believe i played that game it's going to be a yeah. oh my god i can't believe i wasted money on that <laughs> so i could totally see buying it for the miniatures which leads me to another point i wanted to hit tonight at some point is i will buy games at low prices with no interest in ever playing the game especially again that ten dollar less is definitely that range for me the the i will pick up the box no matter how bad the cover looks flip it over to the back to see what the components are are there going to be some like great corn shaped pieces i can use in zolkin are there going to be little sailboats i can replace my ships and seafarers of Catan? is there a really cool d20 die with neat symbols on it is there scenery and man if anything if there's miniature scenery in it i'll probably buy it if it's under 10 bucks I'll probably buy it just for the scenery because I love adding scenery to my RPGs and Gloomhaven. I use flat tiles. I don't like walls. I like flat tiles and I have a ton of D&D &D dungeon tiles, but I love to put 3D scenery out on them. Same thing for the Star Wars RPG. I have a bunch of sci-fi ones and I've got maps from Gamma World. If I see, like, I, I remember buying Mage Knight stuff. I've never played Mage Knight. Mage Knight, the, the original miniature battle game, not the new adventures, awesome solo game. I bought 
a, a set of traps for Mage Knight. I bought a set of chests that literally randomize when you spin a dial because they were awesome little chest miniatures. I bought a siege weapon because it was a siege weapon and I have no interest in playing the game whatsoever. I own towers because Mage Knight eventually put out a whole castle system and that goes to one of those vacation trips. We were in some comic store somewhere up in Kitchener and they had this giant tower, plastic tower pre-painted for like 10 bucks. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'll use it for. Like, I'm not even buying it going, oh, I could use that for D&D this weekend. I'm just like, that'll look great on the table. And to be honest, I don't think I've ever used that tower. It looks good on my shelf. So yeah. I will definitely buy a game for something else, not the game. Yeah, and this and came up in our Discord as well. Uh, there's a lot of people out there, especially miniature RPGers or skirmish battlers. And, and the foot, you know, tabletop uh, warfare type people yep. who are always looking for more scenery, more bits, more, more bits. stuff to add to that layout on the table. And that's mm -hmm. a vitally important thing to them is to have that more scenery and more interesting stuff. Um, but again, that is also a pretty niche thing. Yeah. If you aren't, if you aren't a miniature RPG or, or a tabletop warfare player, um, there may not be any of that, but there may also be, uh, you know, just decorative. Maybe you like to do dioramas or mm -hmm. maybe you want just shelves. Maybe you collect um, obscure Monopoly pieces because there I'm willing to bet that someone out there oh, yeah, collects sure. every single Monopoly player piece. Oh, trust me, because they did blind packs and I know some people who went nuts mm -hmm. and VTS like, like went silly trying to find all of them. But I believe they were actually that there was actually uh, some problems with that whole thing. I I, I seem to remember. Yeah, some there YouTube, was there was some news uh, and stuff going on. Yeah, about some that YouTube one. stuff about that. But yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a thing. And collecting yeah. like that um, is is again where you know if you're if you're a collector, then your price your minimum price is probably a little higher because yeah. it has that emotional connection to you. I know someone locally that would buy any game that was under $5 for the box. All they wanted was the small size box and they wanted board game boxes to decorate a wall. They wanted to, to, to make their game room look cool and didn't care if they were good games, just wanted this wall of games and all 3D with different box sizes and shapes. And when they just wanted the lids of boxes. And they're like, at under five bucks, I'll buy it. At under 10, I'll buy it if it looks neater. Like if it's got really good cover art, right. I'll go up to 10, right? So there's a reason. So there are lots of reasons, I honestly think, to buy a game, not just to play the game. Um, then there's the hoarding aspect. Some people like to brag about how big their collections are. Thankfully, I got over this one. I don't, I don't know what, but when I ran out of physical space was when it clicked in that I'm like, no, I really don't need to be a collector anymore i don't have to own these games just to wow people who walk into my basement or wow myself make me feel good and go look I, I i have had so many people say oh my god he has more games in the game store and i'm like yes i do and that used to make me feel proud now i'm like yeah i do but i just i collect games i talk about games it's now my life this is what i do for a living that's why i have all these games but it, like i also have a lot more upstairs i'm willing to sell and i'm trying to make room are there any you really like because i might be willing to sell them to you right like that's gone but there are people out there for good or bad who just want to buy right they want more they want the bragging rights they want to have the largest collection they want to try every game i've seen new gamers a lot of new gamers come in and go i want to play every hobby board game and i'm like you know back in 2000 you might have been able to pull that off not anymore not even close like, and i mean you couldn't and well i mean you know shelfies are a thing right you know if yes. you want to you want to have the games to make the best shelfie um mm -hmm it's it's a thing i don't agree with it i think it's ridiculous but it's a thing that people do and uh i don't you know again it's not for me but more power to if you want to partake in that uh aspect and, of the hobby and i gotta say retail therapy could be a good or a bad thing i i'm just glad people are buying games instead of some other stuff at least mm -hmm. to me that makes more sense fair enough so all of this really does matter it, it like it, it, i hate saying it but like my main answer is it depends it, it depends <laughs> how much income i have it depends the, the biggest ones for me so do i have anything in the pile of shame like do i or even more so do i have anything on the pile of obligation do i have games i need to play right now so i don't want to get distracted by a new thing good or bad next is do i have my pile of shame is there stuff in my collection that i want to go in go go dive into and play why get something new when i have games i was excited about just get those to the table. When am I playing? 
Am I having a regular game night? Am I we back to hosting games? Like I'll admit, I bought way more games when every Saturday I was introducing new people to games on the weekend. And then that price point changed because I would buy games I considered bad that I thought other people would like. That's gone now because I'm only buying games I think I'm going to like or my kids are going to like or my family's going to like. And and all of that, right? Like, is there public play going on? Is there, am I on vacation? That still impacts it. Am I, am I spending money? Do we have a lot of spare money? All of that impacts it. The one thing we haven't talked about yet, though, that I think is important is what is a bad game? Like the question said, what's your, your low price point to bad game ratio? And I got to say, I would not buy a bad game if I knew it was a bad game. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a, there's a, back to what I was talking about earlier, there's kind of a, a scale, right? So there's a bad game that's just, this isn't a game, you know, this is, this is Candyland. This is, this is garbage. There's no, there's no fun in this. There's no point in this, but at a certain point, that game can shift from bad into, uh, you know, bad movie, B movie, bad. Yep. So um, bad it's good. So bad it's good. Um, Masters of the Universe is, is our example. No one should ever go out no. and, and do no. Don't well, do no, it. No, what? If you can get that game for under 10 bucks, do it just to have it. Yeah. Under 15, probably. But, you know, at a certain point, it's like, is uh, there are certain kinds of monopoly out there where it's like, oh my God, I can't believe they made that. I need to try that. Um, or, or other sort of, you know, silly themed games where I can't believe they did that. That would be so dumb. It'll be fun to play once. And, mm -hmm. you know, for five bucks, for 10 bucks, maybe it's fun enough to play once. Maybe um, you find the looping Louie, you know, yeah, <laughs> they'd yeah. be actually fantastic, even though it's silly gimmicky game. Exactly. Or, I mean, you know, something like Go Cuckoo, right? Yeah. It's, it's just this I, silly little, oh my one. God, is that pick up sticks? No, it's not. It's something different. Um, and, and maybe that's what you come or, or you find a game and you decide that, oh, this is horrible, but you know what, if we home rule this, this, and this, this all of a sudden becomes a kind of fun game. Um, there's a, a, a game I have that Mo and I actually home ruled and it's a silly little dungeon rescue the princess game where you can like turn thing, people into toadstools and with magic and we mm -hmm. home ruled the magic rules on it. And it became a way better game than it ever was, actually. So, so I want to interrupt with that, because this is something I completely didn't think of, because I am not a game designer. I have written a few RPGs. I even won a couple contests. But I am definitely not a board game designer in any way, shape, or form, nor do I have any desire to be one. I want to play other people's games. That's just not my jam. But I bet you Roger's answer to this would be completely different than ours. As someone who designs and prototypes games and is always looking for components and new way things should be done, like Roger would probably buy any game out there on the entire market if it was $5 or less just to see what that game does. What's this game do? How does it do it differently? And I think that's totally valid. If you're a game designer, one of the things you should do is an immerse yourself in as many different games as you can, good and bad. Get the terrible game and find out why is it terrible and think about how to make it better. And then as a very and, valid, thing. and then after you play it, maybe reuse the components in one of your prototypes. Yes. Uh, because again, you can't necessarily use those components in your game, but prototyping is all about failing faster. So if you can use the cards from this game to get your idea to the table and find mm -hmm. out whether it works or not, more power to you. Yeah. So honestly, like bad game, if we're, you're talking like a bad game, it's, it's rated terrible. It's, it's, we're going to be talking about one later in the show, actually. In the Bellhops tabletop segment, there, there's no reason to pick that up. The, the game, I'm, I'm trying to be elusive. I probably shouldn't. All I'm thinking about is people will be watching this segment as standalone, so I don't necessarily want to say it, stay tuned later. But I'm going to say it, stay tuned later to learn about one of these terrible games. I, that's why I changed the question a bit and kind of reworded it to say potentially not great games or games you're unsure of or games you don't know if they're going to be good or bad. Because I'm not going to, it doesn't matter. Like like I said, I've turned down free games because they didn't look like games. They didn't look fun. They didn't look, they, they, they were what I would consider a bad game. A game that really doesn't fit with me or my group. I, I turned down on a almost daily basis, a game with white text on a black background and black text on a white background. We get pitched those. And I sometimes I share them with Dee and Sean if they're at least a little interesting. There was one this week that at least did something a little different. We turn on those all the time and I get offered these like no obligation. We'll just send me your, send you your game. You don't even have to talk about it, but if you like it, it'd be awesome. You got a shout out. And I'm like, no, sorry, not a good fit for us. 
And I'm like, and, and there's definitely a uh, reviewer bell curve where you first get your first free games. So like, yes, yeah, send me everything. This is awesome. People like my stuff. They're giving me free stuff to eventually. Like, no, not every yeah, game. Yeah, please, please stop. Please stop. Please. <laughs> I get so many emails on on bad versions of apples to apples with whatever offensive topic of the day they want involved in it. Yep. So I actually look at it more of a games. It, it, it's more what amount of money would I take a chance? I think is the true question here. And for me at this point, it's got to be $10 or less, like, like, it, like five to $10. Like I just, I don't have that spare money. I have plenty of games in my pile of shame. And at that price, it's still got to catch my eye somehow. And it's got to be in person. Like, I'm not going to buy Marvel Strike Force, even if it gets down to $4. Like, Abandon All Artist Folks was like $3.99. And I'm like, if I had seen that in person, if I walked into our local game store, if I went into uh, the CG Realm and I saw Abandon All Artist Folks for $3.99, I'd, I'd be like, hey, can we afford three bucks? Yeah, let's get this. It's supposed to be pretty. But online, I've seen that offer. I've even seen that in Canadian, and I've not bought it. And we even have Amazon.ca credit, and I've not bought it. So, But it's got to be really low at this point for me. And RPGs, zero. I, I will not buy an RPG because I have so many that I haven't played, haven't touched, haven't read. I'm like Sean. I don't. I don't have it. Maybe if I could specify a genre, I could then fixate on collecting that genre. There you go. Like I get it. I've been a collector. I totally get trying to get all the supers RPGs. But with me liking all kinds of RPGs, I'm like no. Like I'm the only time I will spend money on an RPG now tends to be if one of my personal friends kickstarts something and I want to support them. The last oh there you go I did buy a game last year or oh, maybe that was 2020 as well I bought Worldwide Wrestling. Right. Well, yeah, with that was on that was in chaos. Or was that like that 2019? Was I, I it was 2019 2020. I don't think that was 2021. Oh, so there you it go. Delivered so it delivered in 2021, so it, it had delivered to be in 20. All right, so there that was one I actually I was going to say I did buy a game I bought that, but. And, and I will say the last 2019, in 2019, I went to Origins, I bought games, and I went to Breakout Con, and I bought games off Todd Crapper. I bought his awesome um, oh, High Plane Samurai RPG. Um, I bought a copy of Tales from the Loop after playing it at Queen City Conquest under Ange. So I have bought stuff, but all of that's all pre-pandemic. Yep. And I got to say, that is something we'll do it. Uh, a con will get me to play a game. I, like That's how I discovered Card Kingdoms of Valeria. Sat down at a booth at Origins, played the game, met the Miko, and went, I got to have this. Like, how much is this? Give me this. Like, oh, you buy it now. We'll throw in the expansion pack and this awesome Miko card. And I'm like, yes, give it to me. And some purple nerds, because that was their thing then. Well, yeah, Miko can Miko could get you to buy pretty much anything. Well, now, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there, no, yeah, no, we're, we're, it's definitely ahead. there's definitely a lot of, of different factors involved. And again, you know, it. Yeah, what is a bad game is such a huge factor in this. Um, you know, bad as a 2.0 on board game geek, there might not be much that could get us to buy it. But bad oh, as it's a 4.0 on board game geek, and everyone is like, "Oh my god, you can't believe this thing!" Maybe that is okay. Uh, it, it's it's all about, and you know, the theme is going to attract one person versus another. Uh, oh yeah, another. Uh, again, you know, master the Masters of the Universe disaster may be, you know, turn off a lot of people. But you know, if you were a Masters of the Universe fan, maybe that's a right now mm -hmm. must grab. Uh, I didn't even think of that. Actually, there's where theme, artwork, and presentation will sway me. When I don't know anything else about the game, that's what's going to give me that chance to pick it up as that that last minute uh, impulse buy. No, like I like I know Renegade put out a new GI Joe card game, and I'm just like I don't need a new card game. But if I walked in somewhere and they had the GI Joe deck builder for ten bucks, I'd be like, eh, I guess I'll give it a try. I like I grew up on GI Joe. I like GI Joe. I like deck builders, but full price, I'm like, nah. I got enough other games to play. Yeah, I mean, I'll be fair. I I beta tested that card game, uh, and and yeah, if it was twenty five bucks, I would probably pick it up. It it didn't catch me enough to to make me want to put put it on my shelf as a full price game um it was yeah it was a f interesting deck builder but it didn't and but even with the kitsch value and the my history with gi joe you know my my love of it as a child it it still isn't a game where it did enough interesting things to make me want to go out and spend mm -hmm. 45 bucks on it but 25 bucks yeah i'd probably buy it in a heartbeat yeah see i'm more than 20 or less 10 to 15 15 i think is my price point on that one See that for fifty, but again, if I saw that as an Amazon sale, I probably wouldn't do it. Yeah, I need to. I need to be able to like bring it home, 
here's the other thing. Eric, I didn't even think of this. One other thing that's impacted my purchasing lately is I, I try to unbox everything now because I'm like, well, I might as well unbox it, right? Which means I can't bring it home, crack it open, and read the rules right now, which actually has changed me wanting to get something. I'm like, oh, I'll get that. But then I got to unbox it. Excuse me. Then I got to unbox it. And then we got to have three people over. And then I'm, ah, forget it. We'll just play something that's here. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right. Well, I think that's it for our talk of how low a price has to be before we would consider picking up a not so great game. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic in the comments below or social media in general. Mm -hmm. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, all you got to do is head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop or send me an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com.